So this was Eno's principle. As I said, he died in 715, and he left five very great disciples who taught substantially the same sort of thing. But as things go, then these disciples had disciples, and those disciples had disciples, and there's a genealogy. And Zen broke into what are called five houses. And these, uh, some of them didn't go on. Zen went on in two main forms. One is called, by the Japanese, Rinzai Zen, after the great master Rinzai, who lived towards the end of the ninth century. And the Soto school comes from another line, and they have a slightly different emphasis. Soto is more serene in its approach, Rinzai more gutsy. Uh, Rinzai people use the koan method in Zen study. Soto people don't, at least not in the same way. But this period between the death of the sixth patriarch, Eno, and about the year 1000 is the golden age of Zen. This, these were the really formative years. And after that, Zen began to decline in China. It became mixed up with other forms of Buddhism, and it suffered the fate of many, many forms of meditation type or yoga type discipline. It got a little bit sidetracked into occult and psychic matters, what are called in Buddhism Siddhi, or the development of supernormal powers. For Zen, this is completely beside the point. But it got involved with Chinese alchemy, with Taoistic alchemy, and all sorts of foolishness in that direction. But a very strong strain of Zen went to Japan, the first being in about 1130, the monk Eisai, and then about 1200, the monk I told you about, Dogen, who founded the great, beautiful, gorgeous, galoptious monastery at Eheji, which exists to this day. Now, in this golden age of Chinese Zen, the main method of study was walking Zen rather than sitting Zen. All monks were great travelers, and they walked for miles and miles through fields and mountains, visiting temples to see if they could find a master who would cause their spark to flash to get what is called in Mandarin, Wu, or in Japanese, Satori, or in Cantonese, Ng. <clears throat> this always rather fascinates me, the way this character is written. The word I in Chinese is sometimes represented by this right-hand side of the character alone. Five mouths, five senses. This one means your mind or heart, the heart-mind, shin. Now, when we say well, something very surprising happened, my heart came into my mouth. Here it comes into all five. So this character means awakening. It's the same in a way as the Sanskrit bodhi, awakening from the illusion of being a separate ego locked up in a bag of skin discovering that you are the whole universe. And of course, if you do discover that, and you do see into it all of a sudden, it's a shock, because your whole common sense is turned directly inside out. Everything is the same as you've always seen it, but completely different. Because you know who you are. You know that, uh, what the devil were you worrying about? What was all that fuss? What was all that to do? Well, you see, it was part of the game. Everything from one point of view is fuss. 
and to do. To do, to do. What is there to do? <laughs> but when you wake up, you see, and discover that all this to do wasn't you, what you thought was you, but was the entire works, which we could just call it, that you're it, and it is it, and everything is it, and it does all things that are done, then that is a great surprise. But it sounds tasteless. It sounds empty. It sounds void. Because if I say, well, you're all it, that is a statement without the slightest logical sense. Because we don't know what is it unless there's something that isn't it. But if it's both all is's and all isn'ts, then we can't think about it. Nevertheless, it is highly possible to see that that's so in a way that's so vivid it brings your heart into all your five mouths. Out of Your Mind now continues with the next lecture from the World as Just So lecture series. In this morning's talk, I was going into some of the fundamental features of Zen. And today, I want to concentrate on that aspect of Zen practice, which is called in Chinese, Mo Chi Chu, or going straight ahead. A master who was once asked, what is the Tao, the way, replied, walk on. Actually, go, as we say, go, man, go, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> and it is this aspect of Zen which is what is truly understood by detachment or having a mind that isn't sticky and that isn't stopped at any point in its whole working. To be stopped at a certain point is what is called having a doubt. As when one fumbles or wobbles or hesitates about something, trying to find the right solution for the circumstances by thinking it out in a situation where there really is no time to think it out. So that when a Zen teacher asks his disciple a question, he expects an immediate answer, as it were, without thought or premeditation. They speak in Zen, they use a phrase, to have a mind of no deliberation. And they also speak of a kind of person, a man who doesn't depend on anything. That is to say, on a formula, on a theory, on a belief to govern his action. And this person who doesn't stick anywhere is like Dante's image at the end of the Paradiso where he says in the presence of the vision of God, but my volition now and my desires were moved as a wheel revolving evenly by love that moves the sun and other stars. And the image of the wheel which is not too tight on its axle and not too loose that is really with the axle, is the Zen principle of not being attached, not being sticky. It's very difficult for us to function in that way because we've been brought up to believe that there are two sides to ourselves. One, the animal side, and the other, the human and civilized side. And these are expressed in what Freud calls the pleasure principle, which he classifies with the animal side, with the id, and the other, the reality principle, which he puts on the side of society and the superego. And man is so split that he is in a constant fight between these two. Theosophists 
sometimes speak of our having two selves, the higher self, which is spiritual, and the lower self, which is merely psychic, the ego. And therefore, the problem of life is to make the one self, the higher one, take charge of the lower as a rider takes charge of a horse. But the problem that constantly arises is, how do you know that what you think is your higher self isn't really your lower self in disguise? When a thief is robbing a house and the police enter on the ground floor, the thief goes up to the second floor, and when the police follow up the stairs, he goes higher and higher until at last he gets out to the rooftop. And in the same way, when one really feels oneself to be the lower self, that is to say, to be a separate ego, and then the moralists come along, they are, of course, the police, and say, you ought not to be selfish, then the ego dissembles and tries to pretend that it's a, he's a good person after all. And therefore, one of the ways of doing this is for the ego to say, I believe I have a higher self. And I would say, why do you believe that? Do you know the higher self? No, if I knew it, I would behave differently. But I'm trying to get there. Well, why are you trying to get there? Well, then the police wouldn't come around. Then the moralists wouldn't preach at me. Then I could feel that I was doing my duty, behaving as a proper member of society. But all this is a great phony front. If you don't know that there is a higher self and you believe that there is one, on whose authority do you believe this? You say, oh, such and such a teacher, Buddha, Jesus, Shankara, the Upanishads, said that we have a higher self. And I believe it. Catholics sometimes say they believe their religion because they're told to, and they have to be obedient. The catechism starts out, I mean the Baltimore Catechism, it starts out, we are bound to believe that there is but one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, etc. And they make jokes about the Protestants and say, they don't have real authority in the Protestant church because everybody interprets the Bible according to his own opinion. But we have an authoritative interpretation of the Bible. But this always screens out the fact that it is fundamentally a matter of your own opinion that you accept the authority of the church to interpret the Bible. You cannot escape in all matters of belief from opinion. In other words, it must become clear to you that you yourself create all the authorities you accept. And if you create them in order to dissimulate, in order to pretend that your motivations and your character are different, that you would like them to be different, this is the same old principle of the separate self trying to improve itself so that it will live longer or survive in the spiritual world or attain the riches and the progress of enlightenment. And the whole thing is phony. <laughs>